Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm Jan Barris, Vice President of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. We're delighted to welcome all of you here. Uh, I'm especially delighted because both of the women sitting up here are part of one of the flagship programs of the National Committee, our Public Intellectuals Program, whose aim is to find the best and the brightest of the younger generation of China specialists in the United States and sort of give them some additional, not that they need it, but um, beyond what they would otherwise get, sort of nurturing to get them outside of their own narrow academic focus and to get them to think um, cross dis in a cross-disciplinary manner about China and to use whatever knowledge and skills they already have to supplement those with some media training that we give them and other opportunities for them to meet American specialists and Chinese specialists that they might not otherwise have a chance to meet, um, people in the policy areas, and to encourage them to become public int intellectuals, either in their local communities or on a larger scale. And both our speaker tonight, Mary Gallagher, is part of, we now have five cohorts of this program, and Mary is part <laughs> of the first, first cohort, and Gao Qin is part of the fourth cohort. Mm -hmm. uh, I just came back from a meeting yesterday with our fifth cohort in Washington, D.C. So <coughs> I'm just delighted to welcome both of them. Um, we're, they're both good friends in addition to being professional colleagues, and you're in for a treat. Just two other things. Uh, please not only turn off your cell phones, not just the sound, but let's give our guests the courtesy of your full attention, which means turning off your phones. And second, to all of the Jews in the crowd, we apologize that we're taking you away from the first night of Hanukkah. But it was the only night that Mary was available here. So you can celebrate when you go home, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Jan. Thanks, Jan and Margot, for inviting me, and um, I'm really happy to come to the National Committee. I haven't been to these offices. Um, I realized when I uh, was sitting here and she was introducing me that I also have my dad and my brother in the audience, and they are the two lawyers in my family. <laughs> <laughs> one went to NYU and one went to University of Michigan, so we were sort of sharing the wealth between two great law schools. Um, so I am not a lawyer. I'm going to talk about law today. I'm going to talk about a book that I recently finished and published. Um, and I will try to, <laughs> I didn't put a timer on it, I didn't think. So that was weird. Um, I'm going to try to talk for about 20 minutes or so, which means <coughs> I will end around 6.15 so that we have time for questions. I know some people have to uh, leave and I want to hear what people have to say and have a discussion. So the book is motivated by um, two puzzles that um, I noticed uh, really way back in the early, in the 90s when I started doing uh, my dissertation research, which was about a different topic, and but also about labor. And uh, at the time, the labor law in 1995 was being um, discussed and fi drafted and finally passed. And um, the two puzzles are, are these, the Chinese uh, labor laws, employment laws, measured by the OECD are among the highest in the world, particularly for security. Uh, from the 1995 national labor law to the very famous or more famous or infamous, if you're low D white, <laughs> uh, 2008 labor contract law, which was uh, revised in 2012 to become even more protective. And the other puzzle is that China also spends, the Chinese government spends a lot of resources publicizing um, legal protections through the media and the propaganda system, and also just through books and magazines and newspapers. And if you go to a bookstore in China and you go to the legal section, you'll find a lot of sort of self-help books that will teach people about how to file lawsuits for any kind of legal issue, but particularly for, for workplace um, disputes. Um, this is measured by a, gr a group called the World Justice uh, Project. I'll show that in a minute. So this is the OECD, where they try to measure um, security. This, the, I'm sorry, the blue is the blue is individual and the red are collective. And I'm trying to find mm -hmm. the real chart is on. Is there, a, is there a light? So anyway, China is over here. So China, these are um, other countries that are outside of the OECD. China has the highest um, rate of protections among these countries. The line across is the German, is the, the OECD average. And even countries like Germany, which is on the far protective side of the OECD, China is, is higher than Germany. 
Um, this is from this measure the World Justice Project took to take, um, looking at rule of law in general, and China performs poorly on most rule of law measures, as you might expect, um, but in terms of one measure called the laws are publicized and accessible, China far outranks <coughs> its, um, this is a little bit hard to, to point to, but this is that measure. So China is um, 16th globally, it's, it ranks highest uh, two, I think, in its income uh, level, and also within the East Asian region, it's about in the middle. So again, this is a sort of unusual <coughs> thing for an authoritarian government to do, to make laws that are very protective and also to publicize the, the rights to the population. So the book looks at this, um, and the first thing that it does is it tries to, dis to, to, tell you, to tell you why I think the Chinese government is doing that. So it's sort of a model for why a government would undertake these, these legal protections and then publicize them. The book also then shows sort of empirically through interviews and qualitative uh, research at a legal aid center as well as some surveys what have been the effects of these laws on workers. And the third thing is <coughs> looking at what's been happening more recently with, uh, among at least some subset of workers, disappointment with these, these laws and protections as they are actually um, experienced on the ground as opposed to just in the books. So for the first part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about this sort of why question, and there are three components. One is urbanization and the government's plan for urbanization. The second is the government, the central government's need to manage center local relations. And the third is um, building hierarchical trust, which is this notion of making people believe in the central government as a benevolent <coughs> government and the lo local government as, as somehow um, taking the central government's intentions and, and, and changing them and making them more selfish and not protective or benevolent. So the first um, issue is urbanization. And the book is framed around this um, issue of why employment security is so important to China's urbanization. So China has this new plan announced in 2014 to urbanize tens of millions of people. Uh, and this includes both rural people who will be sort of brought into suburban areas and given urban hukou, as well as rural migrants who are already working in Chinese cities. Although obviously there are variations in terms of how cities um, are covered in the urbanization plan. And you might have questions later about what's going on in Beijing, which is a very strict, has very strict um, limitations on urbanization. But <clears throat> this plan is very closely linked to employment security because China's welfare system is built around employment-based welfare. There are mm -hmm. residenc residency-based programs, there are low-income programs, but by and large, if you wanna have a high degree of protection, like a pension and like health insurance, you're going to need a formal contract, and you're going to need a formal job. So really part of the imperative for the government is that if you want to change people's security from land security to employment security, you need to expand workplace protections and you need to bring people into the formal um, system with labor contracts. There are reasons for this, for the social insurance system in particular because China's uh, work, um, uh, working age population is declining and to bring young migrants into the social insurance system, paying into the pension system would also help a lot of local governments. So the idea for the urbanization imperative is that the expansion of labor rights is really not a political or a move to um, expand rights to migrant workers or to rural people because the government cares about th that in particular, but rather that it has this broader strategy of urbanization. So you exchange land for urban residency, you gain urban formal employment, you gain access to urban social insurance, and then this is what the government calls new style urbanization. The second issue is related, and the issue is how does the central government implement this plan um, and make local governments care about things beyond local uh, economic growth? So in a sense, previously the Chinese reform program was very much um, on the, based on the assumption that central government and local government incentives were aligned. Everybody wanted a better off society, people wanted high rates of economic growth, and if local governments could satisfy that, they would be successful, they would be promoted, they would be appointed upwards, they would probably also become personally wealthy. Um, and now the central government is saying you need to care about other things. You need to care about the environment, you need to care about labor standards, you need to care about food safety, and so one reason why the government might be telling people about their rights 
and mobilizing people from below is they're trying to put bottom-up pressure uh, on local governments. <coughs> and this has historical antecedents. In Maoist China, this is a poster from the um, early campaigns of the 1950s where people were encouraged to participate uh, in political campaigns, in, in campaigns to enforce policy. So the third is hierarchical trust. So this is a notion that I think uh, political scientist uh, Lian Zhangli in Hong Kong developed, which notes this um, unusual facet of Chinese politics where people tend in survey research to really trust the central government and not to trust the local government, which is, I always point out to my students, it's the opposite of American politics, where I think the Ann Arbor mayor is great, like he's totally not corrupt, and he's also a Democrat, of course, so I like him. <laughs> but, um, and so people in America will, will have very um, negative um, evaluations of national level politicians and will tend to trust local level politicians more. Um, in China, it's the reverse. People have this um, sense of benevolency among the central government and believing that the local government is corrupt and the local government takes these benevolent laws and, and, um, and uh, mis misaligns them and doesn't enforce them. So the central government passes these laws, these good protective laws, and then it blames the local governments on lack of enforcement. Okay, so, um, so that's sort of the model of why the Chinese government might be doing these things. It is satisfying some of its broader stra strategies in terms of organization, and it's also, I think, giving the central government a sense of legitimacy. <clears throat> so um, the second part of the book, um, or the second goal of the book is to talk about, well, how did this actually work on the ground? How did these laws, when they were enforced, um, who did they benefit? And so basically, these are some of the conclusions which I'm gonna go, f go through quickly. Um, I can talk more in detail in the Q&A. So, the compliance is suboptimal in the sense that because it is so delegated to individual workers, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, the compliance, uh, because it's individualized and not based on sort of collective organizations putting pressure, collective organizations of workers putting pressure on employers, and government enforcement itself is very reactive to individual claims, um, you don't get the type of compliance that most governments would hope for. And this is. Um, using work by David um, Weil, who's a labor economist, has shown that when um, labor protections are highly individualized, you get suboptimal compliance because individual workers don't have a lot of power to um, improve compliance um, in and of themselves. You need either government enforcement or you need collective organization of workers. In terms of the regions, the regions that have the highest level of labor disputes and labor con um, conflict are provincial level cities and the coastal manufacturing enclaves of Guangdong and Jiangsu, so big uh, manufacturing places with a lot of foreign investment, or provincial level cities with a lot of white collar workers who are, who are often using these protections to um, <coughs> improve their workplace uh, rights. In terms of the firms, um, SOEs and foreign in, uh, invested companies, FIEs, are more affected than the private sector. The private sector, though, does tend to have the worst conditions but you don't see uh, enforcement and compliance um, as strong in the private sector. And then at the individual level, the individuals who tend to benefit from these laws and also who tend to think these laws are working better are people who have high skills and high levels of education. The one sort of caveat about that that I think is interesting about the Chinese case is that workers who have a lot of knowledge about the laws, even if they have low education, also have a better sense of satisfaction they think the, the, the laws work better. If you, so if you know a lot about the laws, if you've read a lot of in the propaganda or in your self-help books, you do tend to trust the law more. So there is this way in which the propaganda and the use of um, legal um, dissemination campaigns has increased government legitimacy, that people who, who use that access to information are more satisfied. Um, so this, I'm gonna skip most of these. These are just showing these things by region, this is by firms, um, and then labor contract prevalence. But just for, I just wanted to show in terms of um, the improvements, not mm -hmm. to say there have been no improvements, because there have been pretty significant improvements. This is from the China <coughs> Urban Labor Force <coughs> Survey, which is um, a six city regional survey. So it's, it's, it's um, first and second tier cities, but dispersed across China. In 2001, 30% of wage migrant workers had contracts. By 2010, that had doubled, or nearly doubled. 
So there are some sort of significant changes. It's not as um, impressive among all workers, people who are in like construction or services, they're not as well protected, but um, there have been some pretty significant um, improvements. But because of this um, legal mobilization, and I'm not gonna get into the legal details because you might fall asleep, but um, also I'm happy to talk about it. Some, some of you probably already know it, but this is a, a system that is heavily fragmented and that um, tends to, anytime workers even come uh, with a group grievance, uh, the legal system and even the arbitration system, which happens before litigation, will almost always um, encourage or even coerce workers to file individually. So you see very, very few disputes that are collective. There are restrictions on freedom of association. There's only one trade union in China, uh, an uh, umbrella level uh, trade union under the Communist Party. And um, in more recent years, there's been a lot of harassment and arrest of labor activists. So it's a very politically constrained model of enforcement, <clears throat> which is why I argue you see these elite effects, that it tends to help people who have more power to bargain with their, with their employer to get these rights and protections. But if you're low skilled or, or, or low educated and you're, uh, you cannot sort of bind together with people who are like you, you're not gonna be well served by these laws. Which brings me to the third part um, of, the, of the, the goal of the book. Um, and in, in the book, I look at a couple of cases in particular that started out with workers being very legalistic, really trying to use the legal system effectively, um, going to arbitration, going to the courts, and finding barriers uh, at every step, and long delays, and also some, some uh, coercion and intimidation by employers and also by uh, local government officials. <clears throat> and what happens to, um, in these cases with these groups of workers is eventually it ends up into protest, into demonstrations, and then into repression. So why we um, seem to see this interesting predicament in China where you have more and more uh, legal disputes, so more and more people going to the courts, but at the same time you also see more and more people taking to the streets, that there's this, this interaction between people using the legal system and people using protests uh, which is what, not what the government expected. Actually, the, the National People's Congress, when they were passing the labor contract law, um, one, of the, one of the major um, NPC um, uh, legislators said, this will be like a channel, and labor disputes will be the water flowing through the channel. That the legal system will be a channel for social tension and social disputes. Uh, and instead what we saw with the labor contract law was a huge explosion of disputes and a big increase in strikes and demonstrations. So what we see are these sort of dysfunctional effects of um, authoritarian legality, of the, the, the government adopting rule of law <clears throat> and adopting institutions that are inclusive and that guarantee protections and that also guarantee a sense of equality between say migrant workers and urban people, but um, are not, are not satisfied on the ground. So um, one of the findings in, in, the, in the survey research, and also I saw in the, in the qualitative interviews with legal aid recipients, is that people would say uh, in these qualitative interviews that, you know, I went in with this big sense of expectation and feeling like I was going to get my legal rights um, protected. And I left with this very heavy sense of sort of disappointment and disenchantment. And even in the surveys where we were not doing in-depth interviews, but simply asking people, um, if you had this problem, would you use litigation or would you use administrative measures or would you use petitioning? Um, people who had tried litigation once were much, much less likely to want to try litigation a second time. Which may not be, a, you know, I've read in, in literature in general that this is not a finding that is unique to China. Many people are disappointed when they have actual experience with with the legal system in, in many countries. So this kind of law instability repression is done through case studies of workers trying to use the legal system and then eventually sort of erupting into protest. Mm -hmm. um, and I look at two places, a place, uh, a, a strike that happened in Guangzhou against the state-owned um, hospital and then a Walmart store in, in Changde, Hubei. Um, and I'm not gonna, I won't go into the details, but they're both really interesting 
depictions of how this plays out in detail in different disputes. Since 2010, this is from this picture is from the, the Honda strike in 2010, which is sort of the beginnings of a large increase in strikes in China. Um, and uh, again, there, there's, there, it's a little bit hard to know the labor strikes and protest data since it's collected outside of China by the labor, uh, China Labor Bulletin in Hong Kong. Um, but there seems to be pretty persuasive evidence that every year um, strikes are going up, workplace disputes. Um, are going up. The Honda strike, of course, happened at the height of after the financial crisis where the Chinese economy was really booming and this was for wage increases. People were demanding in the Honda production um, chain for, for, for higher wages. What we see more recently is because of the slowdown in growth, people asking for um, severance arrears and, and things like that. So there, I think there is a little bit of a change in sort of what people are claiming. <coughs> In uh, 2014, there was um, a migrant worker strike in Guangdong, about 40,000 workers asking for social insurance um, payments, back payments that the, that the company hadn't paid for many years. Um, and so one of the other interesting trends that you see are you're seeing migrant workers who used to really just ask for things like wage arrears or overtime pay, now asking for things that really have to do with social security and so social protection. And that has something to do with the aging of the migrant workforce. You're starting to see the first wave of migrant workers who have worked in cities for 20 or 30 years, who are getting older, and who want ha to have some sort of social security. Mm. And uh, relatedly, in 2014, because of a lot of uh, labor activism and civil society that had been kind of tolerated in Guangdong province <coughs> for several years, um, a big crackdown and, and arrests on, uh, of labor activists. So um, the book tries to frame this at the end um, using Lo Jiwei as my foil because Lo Jiwei, who I've never, I don't know him, I've never, you know, encountered him, but um, he made a very um, interesting, he is Lo, Lo Jiwei was, is the former finance minister of China and is, um, has recently um, stepped down and now runs uh, the National Pension Fund. Um, but when he was finance minister, very unusually in 2015, <coughs> he made two speeches uh, publicly criticizing the labor contract law, saying that it was a bad law, that it was too protective for China's stage of development, and that it was going to stop China from getting out of the middle income trap. Uh, because it was going to increase the, the social burdens on the government, and the government couldn't afford pensions for um, the number of people it was promising. But the problem is, is that China is facing this conundrum of uh, an aging workforce, a workforce that wants social protections and employment security as it gets older, at a time where growth is slowing down. At the same time, the government has these very ambitious plans for urbanization, which will further increase the expectations of migrant workers and rural people who are coming into cities. So whether or not you look at it from the urban aging workforce or from the newly urbanizing migrant workforce, you have rising expectations. And so China has not yet figured out how does it guarantee these protections and these rights to both, part, both classes of, of people. And uh, to end, I will quote <laughs> Xi Jinping, who said this very um, eloquently in his very long speech at the 19th Party Congress, where he said, what we now face is the contradiction between unbalanced and inadequate development and the people's ever-growing needs for a better life. So I will end with the chairman's that well, Mary is our main speaker and it's all about her book. We've also asked Gao Xian who is very knowledgeable about a lot of these issues, particularly <coughs> pensions, and she teaches at Columbia, she's a student in the Bios, Columbia School of Social Work, and is very thoughtful about issues having to do with migrants and people in the working class sectors of China. So she'll be sort of our commentator and moderator for the rest of the evening. Thank you. This is Fascinating, having read the book and then listened to your very succinct talk, it's, uh, it's wonderful. I studied the labor contract law, mm -hmm. mainly the 2008 version, mm -hmm. and what we saw in uh, those studies were a great enhancement mm -hmm. in labor protection and social insurance coverage mm -hmm. for migrant workers. Yeah. What I'm curious about now uh, and would like to hear your comment is what exactly 
happened since 2012, the revisions to the law, uh, maybe for the audience you can talk briefly about uh, what the revisions were about, and uh, were the early um, evidence on the improvement mm -hmm. still continuing right. uh, in the recent trend? And interestingly, this coincides with the shift of the administration, right, mm -hmm. from the Hu Wen to mm -hmm. Xi Jinping, Li Keqiang. And when you mentioned the new style urbanization, uh, that was very much led and uh, uh, vocalized by Li Keqiang, mm -hmm. but not so much anymore, right, mm -hmm. in the recent years. So I'm curious about your take about that. Is the government really pushing right. that agenda, or is it quietly mm -hmm. being neglected? Right. Um, for my own research, I study uh, um, poverty and social policies. So right now, one of my focus uh, areas is the targeted anti-poverty campaign, or Jin Jun Fu Ping. So in Jin Jun Fu Ping, there's a large project, which is relocation, moving entire villages and regions of poor people to mm -hmm. uh, urban areas or towns. Uh, but there's not a lot of mention about whether they are changing their hukou mm -hmm. officially. And uh, the main challenge is that they are not getting jobs right. uh, in the newly um, located areas. I don't know if that's too much beyond what your book is about, but it's very much on my mind, right? You're pushing urbanization <coughs> to lift many poor people out of poverty. But is that sustainable? Is that a plausible approach? Um, lastly, uh, I'm thinking about the children of these migrant workers, mm -hmm. right? They are missing from this book mm -hmm. because that's not your focus. But because social welfare or social insurance is so much linked to work uh, in the Chinese case, the migrant children are excluded right. from local schools, education rights, health care rights. Uh, but as the migrant workers are aging themselves, their kids are part of the urban society. Um, but uh, how are they going to fare? Are they going to be part of these disputes, uh, these uh, dialogues mm -hmm. um, that you cover in the book in today's talk? So I will just share those thoughts. And uh, if you want to comment on them or if you want to open up to the audience. I just have, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I want to just say one thing about the, you had questions about um, the changes since the 2012 mm -hmm. revisions of yeah. the labor contract law and then uh, the change in the administration. Yeah. So one thing that is often sort of rumored about the labor contract law and the revisions were that, that they were done at the tail end of the Hu Wen administration <coughs> to make life difficult for Li Keqiang yeah. and Xi Jinping, <laughs> which I found fascinating because I, I like when it seems like they're actually, you know, policy divisions and also um, policy debates within the, within the, the Communist Party. Um, w and I do think that there is some evidence that the tact that the government has taken with the slowdown, so there are two things that happened nearly at the same time. The Chinese economy slowed down significantly and Xi Jinping came into office. Um, and one way in which the government is dealing with this is not to revise the labor contract law, which is proving very difficult politically, um, although some people say it may happen in the next uh, year or so, uh, but just lack of enforcement, so that the government is not doing anything mm -hmm. to actively uh, enforce it. The other thing that I've discovered after going to China in, in November is that everyone is talking about, as they're talking about in many parts of the world, what's really going to happen is that so many people are going to be employed in the new economy uh, or the gig economy that they will just fall outside yeah. of the protection. Yeah. And so what you might see now in China, I haven't seen any data on it, but I, I would expect to see this um, trend of yeah. decline mm -hmm. in informal employment will change. And you'll mm -hmm. start to see many more people who are employed as, mm -hmm. or self, you'll see a big increase yes. in the number of people who are self-employed, who are doing things like Ni um, Ulama and um, Dianxiang, uh, e yeah. um, or Didi for mm -hmm. like the Uber, so yeah. that you'll see lots and lots of people being employed that way. Yeah. But all, you know, pe this is a, as I mentioned, this is a reactive system, so it's reactive to worker disputes. There are already lawsuits in the Chinese judicial system about the employment status of these of these people. Yeah. When are they when are they workers who get protections, and when are they self-employed? Mm -hmm. But Thank I'll you. I'll yeah. I, I'll be happy to take questions. Please. Very interesting, a very interesting report. <laughs>
Would you please identify yourself? Oh, Jerry Thanks. Cohen, NYU Law School. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a conference in Nanjing on labor law in January, and it was a terrific meeting. But I noticed two subjects were not apparently permitted to be discussed. <laughs> One was the independence of labor unions, mm -hmm. and the other was collective bargaining. Yep. Uh, I wonder what you have to say about those topics and about dispute resolution also, which is always of interest, of course, to yep. lawyers as well as political scientists. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, if I could um, find the, okay, so Lo Jiwei said in, this is 2015 at Tsinghua University, uh, the labor contract law has many shortcomings. Of course, many people will disagree with me, but the law's shortcomings are mainly that it reduces labor market mobility and flexibility. Workers can fire their, their employers, but employers can't terminate workers. That's the reason why many investors had have already left China. Promoting collective bargaining within enterprises is all right, but promoting sectoral or regional bargaining, that's just terrible. It's exactly the cause of Europe's labor market rigidity. In America, Detroit's automotive trade union is very powerful, which is actually not true anymore. Salaries and benefits are very high, which in the end brought about the bankruptcy of the automotive industry. So the collective bargaining is interesting because around 2010 with the Honda strike, when the government, I think, was worried about the um, demands of workers becoming so strong that they wouldn't be able to control them. The, the, particularly in Guangdong, they tried to push collective bargaining as a way to sort of dampen down those expectations and to control wage demands. Um, because sometimes with collective bargaining, you can actually control wage demands as opposed to just exacerbate them, like you see in Germany and Austria. But um, uh, that, that, has, that has left the Mo the feasibility realm um, with the slowdown in growth. And with, I think also with Xi Jinping's just much more um, contained uh, sense of, of how politics should work. Is there a recognized right to strike now? No, there's not. But it occurs frequently. Right. There's also been a debate about whether or not the right to strike should be legalized, and the only province that has done that is, is Guangdong. But the restrictions are such that it's almost that they've legalized away the right to strike. And that was a fear. Like some uh, labor lawyers and um, legal scholars mm -hmm. argued that this is, this is something that you actually don't want to see formally addressed in the legal system because there will be more restrictions on strikes. Right now, strikes occur all of the time in China, but they're basically wildcat strikes. And they're not part of the collective bargaining process. How about the dispute resolution system? Um, I don't, so one thing, I did have this little chart because I knew there were going to be lawyers in the audience. <laughs> so um, this gives you a sense of how a dispute plays out. Um, so if you have the dispute here, at any stage, uh, you have the option to m mediate the dispute. And the one thing that I didn't talk about here, but I talk about in the book, is that since 2012, there's been a huge increase in mediation and informal settlement and, a w and pushing things out of the courts and out of arbitration. <coughs> So you, um, you can go to mediation. If mediation fails, you go to arbitration. If you go to arbitration, you can do mediation or you have an arbitral decision. That can then have a de novo appeal in civil litigation. And then in the civil litigation, you have um, two appeals before it's final. And mediation can always occur at, at any of those levels. In practice, what happens? In practice, what you see since, I, I, I can't, this ends in 2012 because they no longer publish these statistics, so that mm -hmm. happens a lot. Um, so the red bar are the number of arbitrated disputes, and the green bar is the number of total disputes. And so what you see is a, a continued increase in the number of disputes, but um, the arbitration rate uh, mm -hmm. levels off. And mm -hmm. courts? And, and courts as well. So, that, so the courts are uh, some subset of the arbitrated disputes. Other questions? Yes? <coughs> Ira Belkin, also NYU. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your presentation. So, if one were cynical, <laughs> <laughs> one might say this is a system that was designed to fail. Mm -hmm. And mechanisms that could have saved the system basically 
labor contract law made every labor dispute into an individual dispute. But if China had allowed NGOs, legal services, NGOs, or legal aid to grow, or had allowed some collective dispute resolution, it might have mm -hmm. been able to save the system. I mean, is it, uh, is it your assessment that that's just politically unfeasible, or that there was also an economic reason? Um, it just seems like without that, you're basically forcing all of these individual workers who may not be terribly well educated into a kind of a labyrinth right. uh, dispute resolution system. Mm -hmm. and you don't even, and the chart reads great. I mean, <laughs> you've got, to get to court, you've got to go through arbitration and mediation and right. then go to court. And this may be, and this is just over disputes, not over bargaining for wages or, or other things. Does everybody have a question? So I think that, um, and you, you should say what you think too, because I'd be interested in what you think. Um, I think that, uh, and they're related. So the, the, and it goes back to the Xi Jinping quote, is that um, <clears throat> 2010, which was a kind of turning point um, with the, the strikes and the public, those strikes, the, the Honda strike, which shut down the entire um, supply chain of Honda for several weeks in the spring of 2010, seemed to signal um, an openness to maybe doing something that was politically more, at least in, Gu in, in Guangdong, which was the kind of epicenter, um, because the government was worried about being able to manage the rising demands at a time where the, where the economy was growing really rapidly with the government investment program after the global financial crisis. Um, and that desire to try something politically um, risky really dried up when that was going to be under the conditions of slowing economic growth. So I think this is a kind of uncharted territory for the Chinese government where they have managed crises effectively, like the state-owned enterprise layoffs in um, 99 and 2000. Um, this is the first time we'll be managing really protracted social change with the aging of the society and, and, and urbanization at a time where it's China is still growing. It's not that it's it's not growing, but it's growing at a much slower rate. So I think it's the it's the combination. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you to mention your collaboration and the research you have done with the Huadong mm -hmm. Zhengfa, mm -hmm. right? They were offering legal aid. Right. So if you could share what happened there mm -hmm. uh, as an uh, example, uh, partly to answer this question. So one, uh, one way that I collected data for the book was working at a legal aid center um, in Shanghai for, an, uh, starting in 2004, but almost every year after that, um, visiting the center. Uh, it closed in uh, 2014. It closed partly because of the retirement of the, the professor who had started it, but more importantly, I think, because of the political um, sensitivity over legal aid, and particularly legal aid funded by foreign organizations. It was funded by the Ford Foundation, funded by the EU, mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, other, other organizations, that that was becoming politically really difficult. So even a legal aid center that was very politically careful and you know, took indiv individualized uh, legal, law, legal disputes and gave people good representation was no longer feasible. Since the arrest in 2014 in, in Guangdong, you've seen a real um, shrinkage in, in other types of civil society activism, mainly around collective bargaining. Yeah. Uh, Jan? Can you just expand on that? Because the National Committee has done a lot of work trying to help nurture legal aid to people who work in that sector as part of capacity building for NGOs, particularly in the rule of law area. Can you talk a little bit more broadly about legal aid for workers particularly? Um, is there any place where it's still viable and taking place? I've like seen there were some right. instances where the government was actually supporting some legal aid. So in some cases, the government through the trade union has taken over legal aid and is supplying legal aid. I haven't seen much research on that recently, and I haven't followed it over the last couple of years. At the time where I was doing research for the book, um, I was not impressed with 
um, the official legal aid. It was often very pro forma, or it was actually a collaboration with a civil society organization w that was doing the work, and it was getting protection from this sort of government uh, um, affiliation. And I think that's really um, decreased in the in the last few years. So I think there's been a very significant change in in the the, the, the poli political space for for legal aid, but, and that's partly because of. And, it go, and it's the same what you see in labor disputes in other areas is too, a desire to have sort of informal settlement or mediation where legal aid is really not the most important thing that a person needs. The person needs a government unit or a grassroots unit that is going to do the, the mediation. So it would be interesting for people to do research on that kind of mediation and see if people are actually satisfied. Hmm? It gets a little more into the weeds, but for instance, a program like Chimney Falls in Beijing, yes. but that's national. Has that been affected as well? Uh, I don't. I think his group has continued to grow. And, yeah. Um, I, just on the legal aid, I think <laughs> um, you can't look at legal aid as a monolith. There's government legal aid. There's individual um, legal services, NGOs. Some of them, probably to me, applause the most prominent, have been more successful in working closely with the government. The more, the further away you are from the government, the harder it's been to continue. So some uh, legal aids, have, legal aid organizations have been shut down, but others are flourishing. And uh, I would also recommend Aaron Halegwa's yeah, report right. that he did about a year ago on avail access to legal services and labor uh, disputes. Right. Um, it's just that if you create the system that pushes all disputes into individual um, dispute resolution, you should provide a way for those cases to go forward. Now, that really hasn't happened, mm -hmm. but I think the picture on whether it's worthwhile for a network to support a capacity building for legal aid, which I think it still is, because it's still a pretty mixed picture. This, <laughs> I, I just, I mean, all these are important and valuable. I just want to emphasize your point about the changing um, political environment. Mm -hmm. uh, the recent eviction of migrants in Beijing, um, yeah, we don't see a very prominent role from lawyers or legal aid organizations mm -hmm. in there. I mean, it's still very short term, um, but, um, yeah, it, it's a space that uh, is, uh, from my perspective, getting very thin, and uh, the water is uh, not tested too much. So, Margo, you had something to say. Please. Yeah, you made reference to a term that, that she's used quite pre uh, freely, and I wanted, to, if you could expand on it, the middle income trap. And I know it represents yeah. something along the lines of expect, you know, middle class expectations, but it also seems to inform a sort of overarching theme that everything's, you know, we don't want to get there, mm -hmm. and that's why we, you know, ex, you know, cause and effect. Could you sort of expand that? It's also loosely loosely defined. Maybe you could share with, you know, right. your view of that term. Yeah. Maybe you could introduce yourself. Uh, my name is uh, Stan Caswell, a recent tourist to China. So, um, <laughs> so Lo Wei, when he invoked this middle income trap, um, didn't define it, and I've I've read a lot of debates about it among economists who some, some say that it really doesn't exist and that it is something that, um, you know, is sort of cooked up by, you know, the World Bank has a, the World Bank actually sh has different reports even on their website, some show saying that it does exist and some that it doesn't. I think the notion is um, an important one because I think there is still a question of, um, outside of post-World War II uh, European countries and former British Commonwealth countries like the United States, Austria, New Zealand, there have not been that many countries that have moved from middle income status to high income. Mm -hmm. Korea, South mm -hmm. Korea, Japan, um, a, a lot of Southern European countries that were relatively poor after the war. And, and outside of that, is Southeast Asia, we haven't seen it happen yet. So there's this issue of what countries actually move from becoming, you know, not poor anymore. China is not a poor country anymore, but, but high income. Um, there are some arguments about it's the level of inequality, that it's very difficult to move to high income if you have high levels of inequality, which China would, is concerned about. 
Um, for Lo Jiwei in particular, I think it's this notion that China needs to move from labor-intensive manufacturing to, to um, capital-intensive, high-tech, innovative mm -hmm. in, in industrialization. And you see that some, in some of the plans like China, Made in China 2025, which is this thing about innovation and technology. Um, and so Lo Jiwei believes that the Chinese welfare state has promised things that fiscally the Chinese government can cannot yet guarantee to China. That, that That's something that China should do when it is high income, but mm -hmm. it will actually stop it from being successful if they do it at this level of income. Please. Yeah, uh, I'm Phil Ironbrust, the retired journalist. Just picking up on a Xing's point a moment ago about the expulsion of migrant workers from Beijing. Could you comment on that? Well, it gets to your, your question about whether or not new style urbanization is basically no longer on the drawing board. Now, new style urbanization and also any of the recent like five-year plans have always said pretty clearly that the big mega cities on the coast are not mm -hmm. open, right? Their, their populations are not going to expand. Um, Beijing, because of water scarcity and other reasons, it may even shrink. So, um, <coughs> so there's always been this differential plan for different types of cities. But the problem is, is that the cities that everybody wants to move to are the most restricted. And the cities that fewer, let's just say fewer people want to want to move to are, are almost completely open now with no hukou restrictions and a very easy sort of hukou. So hukou, if people don't know, is this urban is, is this household registration system in China. It's it um, follows where you're born or where your parents are born. And people are uh, categorized as urban and rural um, and then a specific place. So most migrant workers in China have rural status. And even if they work in a city for 20 years, um, if they don't have um, a high-end job, it's very unlikely that they will ever qualify to be an urban citizen, which means their kids can't easily get into public schools and they can't, they can't avail themselves of some of these social insurance programs. But again, it really varies according to different, to different cities. So um, the expulsion of the migrants in Beijing Margot was um, just asking me about this in the podcast because there's an article in the New York Times today with more information reporting that also high-end migrants who work for um, tech companies mm -hmm. are also being um, thrown out. So I, you know, I have to read more about it and figure out what's actually going on because I can also imagine that these people may be part of like the gig economy. They don't have mm -hmm. contracts. Uh, they're not getting um, good insurance and good housing from their mm -hmm. employers. So the government may be using this simply as a way to get employers to offer more benefits and to, to build better housing for, not that they usually build housing for their workers, but maybe supply housing or in commercial apartments. So, so I'm not really um, sure what the end game for the expulsion of migrants. It does seem to me that partly it's, it's a knee-jerk reaction by a government that's very worried about stability, even though China seems, I think, from the outside very successful right now, um, uh, a knee-jerk uh, government that reacts to these types of things like the fire with really draconian measures, you know, basically kick everybody out. Yeah, I just want to comment that in our discussion about urbanization, probably it's worth making it really clear. We are talking about really two things. One is urbanization, people moving and living in cities which has been happening and will continue to happen. But the other in China is the hukou reform, right? If you're living in the city but don't have the local hukou or registration status, then you are really not an urban citizen uh, because you're not entitled to any urban benefits, including sending your kids to the local school, which will only continue to be a big challenge. So I think China still continues to struggle with this for me, urbanization is still very much part of the policy, documentation, um, dialogue, but hukou reform doesn't seem to be that prominent at all. Mm -hmm. um, so that worries me, and uh, that shows where the thinking is. Right. Um, they will promote and push for urbanization, including the anti-poverty alleviation project, using urbanization as a channel, but if not simultaneously doing hukou reform, it's not going anywhere. Right. Please. 
organization like Mondesa mm -hmm. would say, you simply give them the legal right to, to mm -hmm. use their land mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. 70 years as anybody who buys an apartment in Beijing has. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have a fair amount of evidence from Taiwan and South Korea that it in fact works that way. And that when you give a peasant the legal right to borrow against land, to lease it to somebody else, or even to, to sell that right, um, the result is a tremendous increase in income at a lower level. Now that would pose a challenge to the finance of the local government. Mm, right. I realize, but there is an alternative approach there, which was partially adopted in the rural property use laws, which have never been fully implemented. And I gather when you, from your model that your view is that that approach to economic development is uh, not going anywhere and, and is, is, uh, is simply not an alternative to the so-called new urbanization. Uh, <coughs> I'm sure, I mean, I didn't look at it in the book and I haven't done research on land. So um, I, I did realize, of course, when I started to look at um, the relationship between employment and, and changing your residency system and then land, like if I started to pull on that string, I would be writing like, I don't know, another book about land. So. Um, I didn't do I didn't do that, um, and I think I just I think that probably two things are going on at the same time that there are you know some parts of the of the of the country will remain more agricultural and this will be you know this was um, I think a plan, but for other parts of the country particularly um, in really densely populated areas you're going to see um, new style urbanization, but um, but I have also read. Um, in studies about land use that one of the problems is is that they basically got that sort of one-off boost in economic in rural economic growth in the 80s when they switched to the household responsibility system and that you don't see the same thing happening um, now and that might be partly because the land holdings are small and they need to be larger for people to really have economies of scale from a legal point of view they've never been fully documented right so a peasant a farmer does not hold in his hands the piece of paper he needs to monetize if he did, you, I think the argument, and there's a fair amount of support based on Taiwan and South Korea and other Asian experience for this, the argument is that there would be a tremendous um, freeing of hidden wealth and right. hidden capital simply because land use rights are unclear right. and undocumented. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that maybe that's a subject for your next book. <laughs> Another minor question uh, about the, the labor law and the way it works. Um, I'm wondering if you spoke to any of the, the uh, managements of foreign invested enterprises, particularly mm -hmm. American foreign invested enterprises, about how they view the law and, and its functioning. And the, the background for that is when it was, uh, when it mm -hmm. was under consideration right. and uh, people were given an opportunity to comment on it, it was pointed out that there are some structural problems in the way the contract law is written. Yep that would inevitably lead to a massive increase yep. in disputes. Yep. And that comment was <coughs> ignored. Mm -hmm. And this, the specific instance, one specific instance is, if you look at severance pay, mm -hmm. it establishes a standard, one, one, um, one month of pay for every year of service. Mm -hmm. But then it adds the clause that this is a minimum standard and that other things are negotiable mm -hmm. in, a, in an individual situation, which immediately meant that every single factory closure or departure of an employee became a negotiated and often arbitrated dispute, uh, which could have been solved if it were simply a standard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in my, my own experiences with uh, the, uh, uh, you know, what some might consider the exploited employees of people like Goldman Sachs and <laughs> Morgan, um, but it, it, it did affect them. They read the law. And they wanted something more than what the law, than what the minimum standard was, and they were prepared to do all kinds of things mm -hmm. uh, to get yeah. it. Yeah. So one of the um, uh, labor law professors who's been really helpful to me always jokes that um, the best, the, the, the labor contract law was the best for labor lawyers mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. human resources because it massively it expanded the human resource industry in China and sort of management of Work, the workplace in a more professional way, and it also, because it increased disputes so much, you saw a big increase in um, labor lawyers in the 90s in China were not making money. Uh, labor lawyers in these days are, are making money. The other thing just about selective enforcement, I think, is uh, about um, uh, 
foreign companies is that one of the, I didn't put this in the book because it's something I would like to write about later um, looking at developing countries in general because in the, in the OECD map that I showed at the, uh, graph that I showed at the beginning, it's actually the case that a lot of places where you see, um, uh, this is Saudi Arabia, Brazil, South Africa, Russia, India, Argentina, <coughs> Latvia and Indonesia. So um, there may be a reason for why some countries adopt high levels of protections that they know in reality often won't be reached because um, this, in a sense, you might want to think about this as the gap between what um, a company could do or, or, or you know, sort of the upper limits of the law, and that gives the government a lot of discretion for selective enforcement. And I think what you see in foreign companies in China, particularly companies that are really well known, um, is, um, is greater attention to labor violations in those places. And so hi hi higher labor standards um, are problematic for companies that are actually going to try to, to, to implement the, the, the laws. Um, I, one comment on that, it's not that they're higher, it's that they're imprecise, they're not fixed. I mean, they're higher in absolute terms, because but yeah, I realize, yeah, yeah. Please. Uh, so, uh, so to could, could you could oh, uh, Ji Li, uh, Rutgers Law School. So, uh, just one quick comment and uh, lawyer comment. <laughs> uh, so, the, the uh, labor dispute resolution the chart represents a standard procedure. Mm, yeah. And in occasional situations, after the second appeal, a party can still petition a higher court to review yeah. the dispute, the decision of the appellate court. But there's actually no end to a labor dispute. Uh, if a party is, has enough resources, it can- It can know, drag it out. Drag it out for years. Um, and second, so um, you discussed the three possible rationales for um, the Chinese government to um, legislate and, and enforce uh, the laws. Uh, but a, a missing uh, possible theory is the fact is factional politics, yes. right? The who yes. wins, uh, who wins is, uh, the, the, the party actually is try, uh, I think to a certain extent, try to reverse the previous policy mm -hmm. that prioritized economic development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so um, to, to what extent do you see factional politics actually drive you know, all the legislation and enforcement uh, struggle in, in this regime? I mean, I have definitely heard people say that to me um, in interviews, and I, I, feel, I find it's very hard to empirically show the, the evidence or that it's, it's some sort of factional. Um, there, are two th there, there are two potential theories about the faction. One could be, I think it is, one could be that um, these different factions have actually different policy preferences. And so in a sense, the Hu Wen administration from 2003 to 2013 was more, um, what would you call it, progressive or sort of leftist, if you want to think about it in sort of European <laughs> terms, more like social democrats. And that the Jiang Zemin administration in the 90s and the Xi Jinping one now is a more sort of conservative right-wing administration and they just have different policy preferences. I think that would be great. I think that would be fascinating and it would really be interesting to see how these things play out. The other factional story that I've heard is different, which is that um, the Hu Wen administration did this just to make things difficult for the, the Xi administration. And it's basically they have no policy preferences that differ. They're just trying to sort of jockey for power. Um, and I think that would be bad. Because I think it would be good if politicians in China actually had policy preferences within the party. Um, and in a sense, make the Communist Party in China more like um, dominant regimes in other parts of the world where there's a dominant party that continues to, to rule and maybe even wins elections, but there are factions within it that have different policy preferences. So I actually recently contributed an article to a, a um, special issue in China Quarterly coming out next year, which is an assessment of the Huwen era social policies, yeah. um, very much on this topic. Anything else, please? Could you talk a little bit about dispatch companies and other <coughs> uh, other methods that employers use to avoid yeah. the obligations of the labor contract law? And divine dispatch companies. 
So one thing that happened um, in the 2012 labor contract law revisions, which was a tightening, uh, even when people had already been unhappy with the law as being too protective, uh, the government, the Hu Wen government at the very end of its term, uh, decided to revise the law. It was the fastest revision in PRC legislative history to revise, a law was passed in 2008, revised four years later. And one of the main changes was to limit, um, it basically subcontracted agency workers mm -hmm. so that you're employing part of your uh, workforce um, through a third party and like manpower that we, we have here in other, other companies. Uh, and it limited it to three criteria and then it also had 10, um, a 10 percent, your workforce, um, no more than 10 percent could be uh, agency workers. The other thing that, of course, when they close a loophole like that, then the other, then a new loophole um, is opened. And so many people argue that what's happened um, with, with the revision is that you now see outsourcing more common. So this white box, so where you'll have a, a, a third company providing like the cleaning at your, at your, um, at your factory, or, or you'll divide up the workforce in really creative ways to make it seem as if they're not core parts of the, of the, of the company. I haven't seen, um, one thing that's happened with this more politically restricted, uh, particularly around the 19th Party Congress, is that there hasn't been as much academic research um, on some of these trends. Um, and so it's hard to actually see what's happening with informality. Um, inf agency workers and, and workers who are employed um, uh, in a, by third parties, I would argue are not informal workers, but they're precarious workers. They're workers that are more easily dismissed and they have lower um, pay and, and lower um, benefits. And that's a global trend around the world, partly with the rise of independent contractors and self-employment, that you see a big increase in precarious work. And I think you'll, you see that in China as well. Jan? Um, so I'd just like to follow up on something that Kathy Lee just said, labor disputes are never ending, and if a dispute maker or a party in a dispute has enough resources, it can go on forever. But I would assume the only people in labor disputes that have enough resources is the management sure. and the people who run the factory. So what does the poor worker who has been laid off or who has a dispute over whatever it is, if legal aid is, I know it's sporadic, in some places it works, in some places it doesn't, but what happens if I work at a factory and there is no legal aid to help me and I can't afford to get a lawyer? Right. What do I do? And, and doesn't you lose, but the government yeah. has to understand. Government is interested in stability. It doesn't want a whole lot of workers out there without recourse to resolving their issues satisfactorily. But that's what they do. I mean, some people just give up, and I think probably the majority of people who don't have the resources or, or can't spend the time simply give up, and then there's some subset of people, and it's highly I mean, strikes are happening in lots of parts of China, so it, we shouldn't just say it's only in, in places like Guangzhou, but Guangzhou has sort of been the epicenter of it, wh where you'll see strikes, demonstrations, and also more individualistic things like petitioning or threatening to commit suicide, things like that. And how successful are the strikes and the petitions and the suicide threats? <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to collect data on that. Um, I think it, at periods of crisis, you know, after the global financial crisis, when there were massive layoffs and big disputes, um, local governments went in and settled disputes. So they would go in. There's papers on this. Um, the street as courtroom, where you'll, they'll go in and they'll settle. And in places like Guangzhou or Shanghai, where the government has resources, or Jiangsu, you can you can use money to 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 settle disputes in that way. It creates a moral hazard, though. I think one of the reasons why you see the the law instability. Um, paradox that Ben Liebman has written about is that when you don't implement the law and when you use these sort of informal settlement practices of paying money if people protest, you're just sending a signal that there's an incentive to protest. So that's one of the reasons why you see protests go up at the same time as legal disputes also are going up. Mm -hmm. Michael. I'm Michael Lanzman with the International Committee. I think one of the interesting things about the book is that there, one of the results of the system as it worked or doesn't work now is an increase in cynicism about the legal system mm -hmm. and the protections that it offers. Right. So it doesn't necessarily immediately result in instability, but that kind of cynicism long term doesn't seem like a very good thing for stability. 
<laughs> right, and the, and the Xi Jinping government has been, I would say, two-faced about rule of law, where they've said um, very strongly um, that in the fourth plenum that they will, you know, strengthen the rule of law and they'll make law enforcement um, more strict. But um, at least in the labor realm, which is where, where I'm most uh, knowledgeable, I, I, I haven't seen that really play out. Please. And, and and so on, yeah. Um, I, I understand a part of it was part of the cost, but do you think there's also that maybe in those early times they had to deal with that um, enforcement? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. So in the in the book, looking at both like f the firms reporting the incidence of labor disputes, it's higher in foreign companies and state companies, and then. Um, in individual surveys of um, households, people who work for foreign companies and state companies are more litigious or more likely to report either having a dispute or, or wanting, you know, using um, litigation as a way to resolve disputes. And I think it's, you know, I think there may be two slightly different reasons. Um, State-owned sector uh, workers have a sense of privilege that goes back to the socialist era. And in foreign companies, I think it's a little bit different, but the foreign companies themselves, the management of foreign companies is very law-based and contract-based. And so it also encourages a certain amount of legalism or legality among their workers. Um, I think the other question, though, about firms working, um, moving inland, I did, it's not in this book, but it, I did recently a paper about um, Apple suppliers when they move inland. And it was very preliminary, I think, the kind of data that we had, but. Um, this is with a grad student, Yu Jong Yang, um, who's a, a grad student at Michigan. <clears throat> what we found is that um, labor standards, at least as they're enforced in the Apple supply chain, are not worse in inland areas. Um, in some, some of the measures, they're actually slightly better, so you don't see the race to the bottom simply because they're moving inland. And I think one reason for that is that the workers' expectations are different when they're in inland China. When they are um, working in factories in their home province. They are closer to their hometowns. They are often living with their families. Um, they are buying apartments or houses in that area, and they have, so they, they have employment security expectations as opposed to just high yeah. wages. And I think that in a se that could mediate their wage demands, but I think they have other sort of like security demands that were really interesting. Okay. One last question. Jen? You've been looking at labor issues for a long time and workers and their relations with management. So how would you assess over the years that you've been surveying this field? Are workers better off now than they were when you first started? Or Such a politically <laughs> sensitive <laughs> question. <laughs> um, yes, they are better, for sure. No matter what measure you look at, this will be maybe politically mm -hmm contentious answer among labor activists, but I would say by any measure, they are better, except for if you slice up the workforce and you look at, say, urban workers, they have much less security than they did. But if you look at things like income or labor mobility or um, even social insurance protections. OSHA rural issues, those things. I mean, <laughs> I mean, there was nothing in the night. I mean, if you look at, say, like death rates in, in coal mines, um, they, they, have, they have started to go down. They were very, very high in the early 2000s. Um, and that's partly because the, the central government has taken, uh, with really serious, egregious problems like mining deaths, they've, they've centralized the line of command um, much higher at the provincial level so that, um, so that, the, so that they could turn around some of these trends. Mm -hmm. So it's partly like what you think where we started. So I started studying Chinese labor in 1994, and I went to factories in 1994. They're not, they were not 
good and I'm, there, I'm not saying that there aren't bad conditions in China now, there are, but um, over time, on, in general, things have gotten better. Mm -hmm. As somebody who studies poverty and inequality, I want to add poverty in China has reduced hugely, so the absolute level is much, much better in this case, yeah. but the expectations and the distribution of work conditions, labor right. rights, uh, social protection, is also hugely uh, widespread. So people's expectations, especially long-term migrant workers who have been urban citizens, but really still excluded from the urban society, I think uh, that's going to be a big challenge moving forward. Yeah, I, th I thought in the migrant worker exclusion cases that have been written up in the, in the um, global media have you know, focused on people in some cases who are being pushed out of Beijing, but have never lived in the city that, or the town where they're from. Mm -hmm. That's a very shocking turn of events. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 yes, absolute in absolute terms, things have gotten better, but at the same time, expectations have gone up, which yeah. is what Xi Jinping said was happening. Exactly, your quote. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary. This is Thank wonderful. You. I learned yeah. a lot. Thank you all so much. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, Oh my god, that's so embarrassing. <laughs> no, this is great.